about the presentation, please put that in the Q&A and I will um, go through and bring those to the attention of our panelists. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the Low Carbon Patent Pledge. My name is Meredith Jacob. I'm the director of the project on copyright and open policy at the program on information justice and intellectual property, which is the public interest IP program at American University Washington College of Law. At PIGIP, we work on a wide range of IP projects where we look at ways to work within the intellectual property system to adapt and respond to specific public interest goals. That includes, for example, supporting the Creative Commons open copyright licenses and working with Professor George Contreras on an ongoing patent pledges project that has included the previous um, open COVID pledge, which was a project where um, organizations and companies pledge patents to work in the fight against um, COVID-19. And most recently in this low carbon patent pledge, which is a partnership between um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Microsoft and Facebook, and is supported by um, WCL where I work, the University of Utah, SJ Quinney School of Law where George works and Helios IP. So thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, George Contreras. Great, Meredith, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of background um, and then turn it over to uh, the people who you really wanna hear from, who are the people uh, who are responsible for the low carbon patent pledge. But just to give a little bit of background for those who are less familiar with this area of patent pledging and uh, what we've been talking about, um, Patent pledges, whoops, no, let me just, here we go. Well, patent pledges are voluntary uh, actions taken by the holders of intellectual property rights, patents in this case. Um, they are public commitments made to voluntarily limit the enforcement or utilization of patents without any direct compensation or expectation of compensation. Um, these pledges come in a variety of forms, and we've known about them for decades now um, in various areas of the private sector. Um, some of you may be familiar with probably the best known of these pledges, which was uh, uh, released by uh, Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla Motors um, in 2014, the famous All Our Patents Are Belong to You pledge. Um, in which Tesla promised to the world that it would no longer initiate patent lawsuits against anyone in good faith who wants to use their technology. Um, Tesla's pledge has evolved significantly since then, as have many others. So there have been numerous studies and academic work around uh, what motivates companies to make these pledges. And uh, rather than go into all of these theories, there's some literature uh, at the end of this presentation that you're welcome to look at. But there are, just to uh, summarize, there are a variety of commercial and non-commercial reasons that firms make these pledges. And we'll hear about some of those um, later in this presentation. Um, the open COVID pledge that Meredith mentioned just a few minutes ago uh, was something that was prompted uh, back uh, over a year ago now in uh, the beginning of 2020 as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was gaining global awareness and uh, became clear that it was a global threat. And there were news stories uh, that were uh, coming out in February, March, April of 2020 about potential barriers that patents were imposing to the manufacturer or the distribution or dissemination of products that were useful in the fight against this emerging pandemic things like uh, hospital ventilators, respirators, masks, as well as the more biopharma uh, products <clears throat> that uh, we have been hearing uh, the most about in the last few months. Um, the result of that was um, a pledge by a number of companies, I'll get to uh, some of them in just a minute, to make IP available free of charge for use in ending the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was launched in April of 2020, um, and um, <clears throat> since then, 
it got significant take up in a number of areas, the high technology sector, uh, large companies, as well as small and medium enterprises, two US national laboratories, uh, one university, and then some coalitions uh, of groups. This is uh, this, this chart, it's, it's, uh, we can't actually fit all the logos anymore on one screen, but you can see um, some of the types of companies uh, that joined this um, to pledge over what we estimate to be a half a million patents to this effort um, in a variety of technology spaces, oops, there we go, um, including medical devices and equipment, um, software, uh, data, um, respirators, um, advanced to very simple technologies, um, a whole range in a variety of areas, all relating to the response against COVID-19. Um, in addition to directly making some of this stuff more available around the world, um, we theorize that there are benefits to innovation um, from making these types of pledges by clearing certain fields of patent risk and litigation, reducing the amount of litigation that we see. Um, and it's important to note a point that it's, it's beneficial even if there's partial clearance of some of these fields. Uh, you don't need 100% of the IP rights in a particular field um, to make it feel more open, uh, to create a commons um, for development um, and innovation, like the open source software area where there's a ton of innovation um, generally on an open basis. And so with COVID-19, we have seen surprisingly little litigation in some of these areas, uh, such as contact tracing um, <clears throat> and uh, equipment, personal protective gear uh, relating to COVID-19, uh, where we have seen a lot of pledging. Now, um, this type of private initiative um, has existed in the green and clean tech space already uh, before. In fact, uh, some of these earlier uh, efforts were uh, we looked at as models when we created the Open COVID pledge. And the best known of these was called the Eco Patent Commons, uh, which was uh, proposed in 2006 by IBM, formed in 2008, um, and grew to include 13 large industrial firms from the US, the Euro Europe, and Japan, um, pledging uh, something north of 100 patents related to green and clean technology. Um, this lasted, uh, the 2008 to 2011 is when members continued to join and contribute patents. Um, the effort uh, wound up in 2016. Um, and the uh, Eco Patent Commons, you know, it, it uh, had as its stated goal, uh, making patents available uh, without assertion or royalty in these areas, the reduction or elimination of natural resource consumption, uh, reducing waste generation or pollution, or providing other environmental benefits. There were some critiques, though, of the, uh, the eco-patent commons, um, that the stewardship of the commons was somewhat inconsistent. It bounced around a little bit among different nonprofits. Um, after 2011, there really weren't any additional companies recruited, um, and it was difficult to know what was going on uh, with usage of the technology, the interface was not very user friendly. Um, and there was a growing realization uh, by people who were looking at this that patents alone um, don't necessarily disseminate technology. Um, the idea that just putting a list up on the web, um, build it and they will come, doesn't necessarily uh, work. And so we, you know, that. It wrapped up uh, five years ago. Uh, many people have thought about uh, this type of mechanism um, since then and uh, thought about how this could be taken forward to the next level. Um, and so that leads us to the low carbon patent pledge, which uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Microsoft, and Facebook um, have uh, led uh, the creation of. Um, there are already over 400 patents uh, pledged, and I will let the other speakers uh, talk more to the details of how this pledge came together, but uh, bear in mind that um, this pledge is following in the footsteps of other efforts that have gone on. And what we hope to do is to improve 
um, and, and learn from past lessons uh, with previous pledges, both in the health side with the Open COVID pledge and the Eco Patent Commons um, that uh, a number of us uh, were involved with um, over the years. So uh, with that, I will uh, leave you with some extra reading in your spare time. We'll make these slides available uh, so everybody can see these. And with that, I will turn it over uh, back to Meredith to uh, turn to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, our next speakers come to us from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We have Brett Alton and Chen Kuo. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'm gonna go first and then pass it to Chen. And I just wanna thank uh, Professor Contreras who um, has been a big influence in the way I think about these things and have thought about them ever since I've been reading his papers for the last, you know, I don't know, decade or more. I really appreciate it. So thank you, Professor Contreras, for all your guidance and, uh, and, and help here. Um, I also wanna, maybe we can go to the next slide. Um, I wanna just talk about how we came, how this kind of came to be or the early phase. And it turns out that, um, you know, Jeremiah and Isabella from Facebook and Microsoft approached me and said, hey, let's do something in the sustainability space. And I said, that's great because we're working on something too. And then we collaborated and came to some final sort of set of language that we all came to market with together. And we, we believe that a collaborative model makes the most sense. And we think the reason or the, the time is right. It's obvious from everything you read in the news these days that we are really reaching a tipping point and that no individual is gonna solve this problem alone. Let's go to the next slide. So a very quick overview of the pledge. It's, it's very simple. Basically the pledge says, if you generate, store or distribute uh, low carbon energy from one of, or more than one of five possible uh, low carbon sources, you get a free license to use those patented technologies. Solar, wind, ocean, hydropower, and geothermal were selected because they felt like they were the cleanest and easiest uh, to sort of bring to market. And there's already, you know, meaningful industries around those spaces. So the field of use is, is very specifically focused on uh, uh, encouraging the adoption of that kind of activity with those kinds of low carbon sources. And what's nice about the pledge is that if you're a company or any institution, you don't have to pledge everything. You get to pick the things that you think the world needs or that you can afford to, to pledge. That was a very key issue because you can have a company who has a very small number of assets, but really doesn't need all of them or you can have a very large number of assets and you don't necessarily need exclusivity across every aspect of those patents to, to make them valuable to you. So this flexibility on company sort of, the ability for a company to select patents is, is very important. Like we said, it's royalty free. And if a pledgee or someone who, a licensee who's benefiting from, from these patented technologies, if, they're, if they actually um, assert an intellectual property infringement claim against the patent owner, the license terminates right away so that you have those patents to use defensively if needed, but you're just prevented from using them uh, offensively in an area that um, against, against someone who's operating in that field of use. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, this is my last slide before I hand it over to Chun. You know, there are a few things that we wanted to just highlight on, on why companies should consider joining. One, we do think it does provide great thought leadership opportunities for whoever is sort of leading this at the company. It could be a sustainability group, could be a patent group, but it also gives you external um, visibility. It also lets you use the community to publicize and, and sort of evangelize 
other initiatives that your company may be doing. And we're open to looking for ways to incorporate that into this broader pledge. One of the nice things that we did is that we made effectively no administrative or financial obligations uh, as part of this pledge. You basically, as a user, just get to use it. You don't have to worry about anything uh, in terms of uh, signing up or there's no termination date. As long as this pledge exists, you get the benefit and it's that, it's that simple. And we are looking into whether or not the pledge could lead to some tax savings for the companies who are pledging these, these rights. That's not uh, baked yet, but we are looking into that. So with that, I'd like to just quickly pass this over to Chun so he has a few minutes to, to talk about a couple patents that we've been, uh, that we pledged. All right, um, thanks, Brett, and a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I figured we would briefly highlight two of the HPE, HPE patents pledged. The first one is US patent 9081880 titled Determining Sustainability of a Data Center. The case is directed to data center architecture for determining the efficiency of data centers, things which are very important for sustainability. The technology measures different performance parameters, such as the type of components and the com uh, combination of devices and components as part of the architecture of the data center. It then quantifies and evaluates the architecture so that a user or operator can judge how efficient the data center is operating and the total uh, potential cost of ownership. By exploring the impact, the impact of different combinations of components within the data center, operators can help optimize the distribution of energy and minimize generation requirements, ultimately helping to reduce the carbon footprint and we hope encourage broader adoption of low carbon energy sources. This allows data center owners and operators to factor sustainability into their planning and operate, uh, operations at the onset or as they plan for upgrades and changes to the data center. Now, in, in one example, the technology covered in this patent is utilized in HPE's Synergy TCO calculator. TCO stands for Total Cost of Ownership. And as uh, you can kind of see from this sample uh, screenshot of the dashboard here on the bottom right side, and through some of the other fields that we have on this report that it measures the um, benefit versus kind of the cost over time so that folks users can more uh, efficiently look to see how their technology solutions are benefiting the um, company, benefiting the industry, benefiting the world, and hopefully also helping to encourage um, better energy sources. Our next case is US patent 76331881. It's titled DC-based data center power architecture. And it describes a power distribution system which increases efficiency in the data center by converting AC power to DC power. The AC to DC conversion is, uh, conversion is combined with a more efficient distribution of DC power with DC voltage, stepping closer to the points of intended use. Performing the conversion and distribution closer to these point of use is a benefit as DC to DC conversion is more efficient than an AC to DC conversion. It performs the AC to DC conversion at, for example, at a rack level with the distribution and stepping within the rack. Um, and the DC to DC stepping is also more efficient than multiple different AC to DC conversions as may have been done uh, in the past and maybe in some current solutions as well. Ultimately, this enables um, optimal distribution of energy within a modern data center, which is important in reducing the carbon footprint of such facilities in general, and also to enable the adoption of uh, more low carbon source power. Um, we don't have a great visual for this one, kind of given the technology, but this technology is used in HPE products and adopted by others in the industry. Um, so I think that is it for our side. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, I think it is really important to hear about specific pledged patents like that to sort of understand how in the technology space, 
these patents and the ability to use them freely can contribute to reducing um, and slowing climate change. Uh, to join us next, we have Isabella Fu from Microsoft to talk a little bit about their perspective on taking the patent pledge and uh, which specific patents might be of interest. Isabella, are you ready to join us? Sorry, this is my, I don't usually use Zoom and I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, um, in the bottom center, there might be a green. Yeah, okay, I got that. Um, let's see if this works. All right, can everyone see, can everyone see my slide on underwater cont container cooling? Yep, all set. Yeah. Okay. Super, thanks, sorry about that. Um, so thanks for having me here today. I am always excited to talk about these open innovation pledges. We've done a number of these, as George mentioned, we um, took the open COVID pledge. We also have some other uh, patent and IP pledges that are, that are unrelated, but generally relate to a lot of the global challenges from today. For example, we have um, some technology and um, patents that are pledged regarding um, our airband initiative, which is an initiative to um, get broadband internet access to underserved rural communities um, throughout the world. Um, so you can look at our website and see that. And then we are also, we've also pledged some patents and, and code relating to um, uh, anonymizing data so that more data can be used in AI applications. Um, and so when we saw this pledge, we were really excited about it. Um, and it's been great working with uh, Brad and Jeremiah and Inger um, at Facebook um, and Gilbert. Uh, and so um, I just want to say, I think this is for us all part of an initiative about thinking about innovation and IP with respect to innovation, instead of just thinking about IP as an exclusionary instrument, which is how I think a lot of us are taught in law school to think about IP. Um, you know, the reality is that the IP system, if you look at it, at least from the United States Constitution, it's really about progressing the arts and allowing people to build on one another's work as opposed to just each, each entity having its own piece and working separately on different solutions. Um, so obviously Microsoft's not an energy company, but we are a huge consumer of energy. And like HPE, we run, you know, a lot of computers. We run a ton of data centers and, um, those data centers obviously use a ton of energy. And so we're always looking to optimize and it's great to, to see the HPE patent on that um, as well. Uh, at Microsoft, we've been carbon neutral since 2012 and we uh, aim to be carbon negative by 2030. And a lot of our effort in there really has to do with operating our own um, data centers and uh, facilities um, as carbon neutral or negative as possible. So this first patent I want to highlight um, describes a container that allows computer equipment to be cooled in the depths of the oceans or the seas. So we think about a traditional data center as being above ground and being cooled, you know, by air and, and you know, obviously all of these very efficient sorts of, you know, air cooling techniques that as well, but all of those use a lot of energy. And so the idea behind this patent is that you can control, you can cool computer equipment by submersing it into the ocean, you know, where it's obviously very, very cold, um, just naturally. So this first patent addresses two challenges with cooling in a marine environment. One is there's contamination from marine life, you know, think about barnacles, that kind of thing. Um, and also, you know, it, there's a you know, huge amount of pressure from the ocean, right? And so you have to, you have to think about that um, as you're submersing something. Um, and so this patent shows a pressure shell with both an internal and an external heat exchanger. Um, and it's oriented um, to allow the water to flow and it shows several different designs of the container to allow the water to flow and cool really efficiently with sort of um, both an inner and an outer heat exchange. Um, it works in conjunction with the second patent that I wanna highlight, let me see if I can get to that, um, which is more about sort of the general structure of a data center and it with it being submerged you know in a large body of water so as you can see here it shows um, again um, it's uh, some heat transfer mechanisms um, and it leveraging you know the capabilities um, of the ocean floor and also shows the data center being further positioned um, to take advantage, for example, of wind power or waves, um, tides, that kind of thing that can, again, help uh, get the water 
flowing efficiently so that you get sort of maximum cooling effect. Um, the interesting thing about this technology is that, you know, we've had a few data submerged data centers. You know, we obviously started this sort of experimentally, I think back in 2016. Um, our two data centers that were submerged near off the coast of Scotland, they actually have one eighth the failure rate of our um, sort of corresponding data centers on land, which is just amazing if you think about it. Um, what the right environment for us as humans isn't necessarily the right environment for computer equipment. Um, and so that that's that was really, I think, a surprising and um, great, you know, result um, from 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 doing these experiments with some of our data centers. Um, if you want to see more about this, uh, you can search Microsoft Project Natick. There's tons of videos that are really interesting where you can see these large containers um, submerged in the sea and what they look like when they come out with a lot of sea scum that can easily be cleaned off. Um, so with that, uh, thanks for listening to me, and I will turn it back to Meredith or maybe it's to Gilbert uh, and Inger at Facebook to show off uh, a little bit of their technology. Thank you very much, Isabella. I think that's a really um, interesting and sort of, you know, something that might not be intuitive to people about what sorts of really complicated technologies are out there that are important for reducing energy use and improving efficiency. Um, next up, we have Inger Meyer and Gilbert Wong who join us from Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and Isabella, if you can pause your screen share and then they'll get yeah. you. Perfect. Thank you very much and welcome. Thanks so much for hosting this today. I'm Inger Meyer and I'm an attorney on Facebook's IP team. I'm going to talk briefly about sustainability about Facebook, highlighting a few of our most significant efforts and accomplishments in this area and how the patent pledge fits into that. And then my colleague Gilbert Wong will talk about a couple of the patents that we've contributed to the pledge. So Facebook takes a holistic approach to sustainability, taking action in a number of ways by minimizing our emissions, using renewable energy and reducing our energy and water usage, protecting workers and the environment and our supply chain, and importantly, partnering with others around us to develop and share solutions for a more sustainable world. We're very excited to be a part of the Low Carbon Patent Pledge, which we consider to be an important and impactful effort to help tackle climate change that's in line with our overall commitment to sustainability. So I have here on the slide uh, just a few of, of our kind of key accomplishments in the sustainability area, starting with net zero emissions in our operations as of 2020. Uh, we reduced emissions by 94% from our 2017 baseline. So we're very proud of that. We've also set an ambitious goal to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions across our value chain by 2030. We, in terms of renewable energy, as of 2020, our global operations are supported by 100% renewable energy with 2.8 gigawatts of wind and solar projects that we have online. And I'd note we're one of the largest corporate buyers of renewable energy globally. In terms of water stewardship, we prioritize that in our operations and are proud to say our data centers, which are 80% more efficient than the average, are among the most efficient in the world in terms of water usage. For example, in 2019, we saved over 2 billion gallons of water worldwide as a result of our efficient data center cooling designs compared to what we would have needed had we used traditional cooling infrastructure. And we've also invested in water restoration projects replenishing more than 180 million gallons of water cumul cumulatively per year. So finally, innovative technical solutions and collaborations. And you know, that's what we're, we're talking about here with this patent pledge. We partner with others to take actions on issues around the environment and sustainability and developing innovative solutions. One, um, one such solution that we developed in 2020, uh, that we launched in 2020 was the Climate Science Information Center on Facebook to help increase access to science-based and dynamic climate information to grow awareness and inspire more people to take action. So on that, we partnered with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their global network of climate science contributors to feature different facts, figures, and data around, around climate change. So our partnership with, with HPE Microsoft and hopefully soon other companies on the low carbon patent pledge is another way in which we're seeking to combat climate change. 
by making certain of our patents freely available for use toward the implementation and development of carbon technologies. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it off to my colleague Gilbert Wong and he'll talk about a couple of the patents we've contributed to the pledge. Thanks, Inger. Uh, really appreciate the invitation here to speak on behalf of Facebook and our sustainability efforts. Uh, when we were approached by this group to join this pledge, we kind of scratched our heads and thought, wait, actually, we don't operate in the space, so what do we actually have to offer? But uh, what we kind of came up with, and, it's, it's, and this is what HPE and um, Microsoft had also realized, is that we are a net consumer of energy, and uh, we actually have quite a few innovations around energy efficiency. So uh, the way we looked at it and the, the classes of patents that we pledged were pretty much fell into three buckets. One was at the device level. So you can think of those as like uh, semiconductor enhancements or kind of power savings where you could just shut off parts of the device. Um, the other one was algorithmic. So at the system level, uh, either sending notifications or doing something affirmatively or not doing something affirmatively based on what's happening in the network or on a particular device or in the data center. And then kind of the most relevant one um, that everyone else has spoken about is the data center patents, which are the ones I'm gonna highlight today. So I have two of them that I'm gonna show you here. This first one uh, kind of looks at the problem of cooling a data center and using, uh, kind of fans to move air through the data center. And that, that, that takes quite a bit of energy. So not only do you have to cool the air, but you have to move it through the data center and exhaust it out. So uh, this invention, what it does is it, uh, it recognizes the fact that you can use pressure differentials between a cold aisle and a hot aisle to passively move air through the data center without additional use of uh, like a cooling fan or kind of exhaust system. So uh, what it shows here is that there's a cold stack where you cool ambient air. So it's usually air that we pull off from the outside. Uh, it gets pushed through to the uh, cold aisle uh, because the cold air is a little denser than the hot, hot side. The air will flow across the competing assets and then it will cool off the assets and hot air rises. So it goes out the stack. Uh, kind of one of the cool little invention that they had here, in addition to this kind of little tweak here, was to the, to realize the fact that you could put some turbines in uh, in the stacks if you wanted to, to generate some power for the data center uh, just by the, the flow through here. This next one uh, really goes toward uh, the realization that as you perform more operations on a server, uh, that necessarily increases the temperature of the server and which re then requires more cooling. Uh, so this looks at how we can bounce load across the data center, uh, but in, in an interesting way. Uh, so again, we have pressure differentials between the cold and hot aisles, and that necessarily determines the flow across a, a, a computing device or a set of computing devices in this case. And for that flow, there is a maximum amount of um, load that you can send to a server that uh, that the server can handle with that cooling, um, kind of the amount of cool air going across before you actually increase the temperature. So the goal here is to maximize the the load of the servers without increasing the temperature for a given uh, pressure differential, and that that helps us. Um, uh, it manage the exhaust. You can see the exhaust units and the, the supply uh, units here, which are active fans that push push air through. So, given those constraints, we have a load balancer that looks at those those dimensions and says, "Okay, well, I can send a certain amount of load to this rack uh, because it still has a, a, a kind of the, a, a enough pressure differential uh, to to, to um, allow us to cool these servers." And it may make a decision uh, in other racks to decrease the load and redistribute across the data center. Uh, so, so that's pretty much it from the Facebook site. So I'll hand it back to Meredith. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had a, a couple of questions come into the Q&A that I'm going to ask uh, to the group of panelists. And so if anyone wants to jump in and um, present the answer from their perspective, uh, that would be great. The first question we had was, what is the incentive for companies like HPE, Microsoft, and Facebook to um, you know, give up some potential royalty on these patents. Um, is there an incentive other than sort of just the um, sort of public regard of having pledged a patent? You know, what are the sort of motivations for companies to get a patent, but then pledge it um, in this structure? Uh, 
Brett, I saw you unmute first. So um, would you be willing to give a first answer on that? Sure. I mean, I think, I think first and foremost, we're trying to do the right thing. Um, it's not always about making money. It's not always about competition. Sometimes, you know, cooperation is more important and collaboration is more important than competition. And I think here the goal is just so clear that we need to do everything we can. And, you know, as IP attorneys or folks at companies with IP rights, we, we can make a, a small contribution. So that's, I think, the most important thing, the, the interest in doing the right thing. I, I also think it's in some ways good for the company as a, as a pledger, because your company begins to build a reputation around the importance it, it you know, sustainability is to the company. We, people begin to sort of associate you with a good, a good actor. And ultimately for companies like HBE, we offer these products and people may actually learn about them through the pledge and it can actually, there can be an enlightened self-interest around, around these pledges. So we're in business, but you know, IP is just a piece of it and this is just worth it for us. I'll pass it off to, a, to another panelist. Isabella, do you have a, a perspective? Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with Brett that there's, there's you know, ben, you know, it's, it's it's good to do it, and there's benefit for the company. I think more and more, actually, as suppliers of goods and services, you know, consumers and businesses are looking to reduce our carbon footprint. Particularly, enterprise customers, like they want their suppliers to be um, carbon negative because they also have goals around these things, or or, or you know, it's frankly going to cost them money. Um, and so, that I think there is actually a, a bigger economic component to this particular pledge. Um, you know, maybe more so than other pledges. But with respect to the other pledges, let me reiterate, I think, you know, that the notion that we're just giving something away isn't quite right. There is a defensive suspension here. There's also just the general notion that um, collaboration is really important for innovation. And if you do not collaborate, right, you will fall behind. And so I think, um, if, for example, you look at sort of the open source movement, or you think about oh, data. Data, if you hold it by yourself, isn't worth anything. If you if you amass enough data to generate some insights, it's worth a lot more. And so, in a lot of ways, when you when you contribute your IP or your knowledge to something, because you are you know you are getting something back with the other companies that that are collaborating, right? You end up you know getting to be able to leverage all that additional knowledge. And of course it's difficult, um, you know, at the beginning stages, as George said, so it's like, you can't just build it and hope people come. You really have to work on it, you know, to make it work. But there is absolutely, I think, you know, a benefit to innovation that will benefit, you know, all the contributors bottom line. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because, you know, a lot of these patents are really about um, at some level reducing energy waste and you know, that really isn't the, the sort of core basis, even to the extent that companies um, might be competitors, that elimination of waste isn't really the, the point of competition. And so everyone going forward benefits from both, I think the perception and the reality that energy intensive companies are working hard to push forward and to reduce energy use and reduce waste whenever possible. So I think, that innovation is really important. Gilbert or Inger, do you want to speak to this question from a um, Facebook perspective? Sure. I, I think everything that Brett and Isabella said is 100% spot on. The only thing I'll add here is that uh, for companies like Facebook, uh, we're purely defensive. And Isabella kind of alluded to that there's, there is a defensive suspension to this pledge. Uh, and we think when we think about patents, we don't think of them offensively. So when opportunities like this come up, and if it makes sense, uh, we look at a, a, at the patents as a way to get the industry to move together and rally around something. And because we don't use it offensively, we don't use, uh, we don't go out and license these patents. Uh, it's a really easy decision for us to say, okay, yeah, you know, this actually makes sense uh, from a global perspective. And we're more than happy to, to band together with other companies to, to do this. Thank you. And I think, again, that's something that may not be um, obvious in the sort of rhetoric that patents are always talked about as an offensive tool, right? Like when you hear about patents in the news, in the context of litigation, it's almost always in the sense of get a patent, assert a patent. And I think one of the things that comes out here is companies often have patents 
that they don't intend to assert or don't intend to make money from the royalties from, but are important to them for other sort of business strategy reasons. George, do you want to talk about that a little? I saw you unmute. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a phenomenon, you know, that that we've known about for a hundred years, right? I mean, of course, a patent can be asserted like a property right. To, uh, and that's one thing that that you can do with it. And I think all of these companies have patents that that can be used offensively. But you know, going back even to the early days of the oil industry with standard oil and its competitors, right? I mean, making your patents available to others will encourage others to make their patents available to you. Um, and just like we had in the 20s with Standard Oil and the, uh, the petroleum cracking patents that it shared with its three biggest competitors on the condition that they all share their patents with each other, that, that enabled um, the, well, I mean, for better or for worse, we're, we're feeling the effects now, but it allowed the gasoline uh, industry to, uh, to, to emerge. Um, and the automotive industry. And, and without it, it would have been much more difficult. So, you know, encouraging others to share is, is a major reason that um, the, the, the sharing, you know, make, makes commercial sense in many instances. Thanks, George. Um, another question, which maybe I'll share my screen and then uh, you guys could talk about a little bit is whether there's a, a standard license involved in the pledge. One of you, I can share the um, the video if one of you would be willing to talk a little bit about the way the pledge is structured. I mean, I I, uh, I I can sort of lead off here, but you know, I think that Facebook and Microsoft looked at this very carefully and 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 uh, confirmed that they they felt it was sort of on point. It, it's a very very simple pledge it's easy for anyone to understand. And that was the driving force here. We wanted to make it clean and simple. Um, and I think it, the, the, the scope of the pledge is really all wrapped up in the first sentence under the word license. Um, and it's royalty free, it's to anyone who wants it. And it goes to a specific field of use. Now, it has the defense of termination and you're not really sort of, um, there, there, are, there are no warranties express or implied and whether these technologies, you know, are gonna be useful or work for a licensee. So it's very simple. It was meant for lawyers and non-lawyers to quickly understand and go to their, to their management and say, hey, let's participate, I get it. It's easy, there's low risk, there's no risk really. And if, for companies that are not actively enforcing in this narrow space, it's a no brainer. Great, I'll thank you. Pass thank it you. off to uh, anyone else who wants to add. I'll just note that there is a homepage for the low carbon patent pledge that includes the pledge itself and then also a dashboard of the pledged IP. Um, so for people who have questions about what types of patents have been pledged so far, you can see that on this website as well. Uh, so anyone who has any more questions about that, the URL is lowcarbonpatentpledge.org, and I'll put that in the chat in just a minute. And so, I would just uh, throw in here um, just the fact that, you know, we're, this, this is a new activity, right? This has been just going on for, uh, for a couple of months now. We're, we're in the process of continuing to refine and improve the, the, the interface and the tools that are available on the website to make it as usable as possible. And, and also to give as much information as possible to uh, potential users of this technology. And, and it's something that we'd love to hear suggestions uh, from those in the audience uh, about you know how how can this be as useful as possible to those who might be in a position to make use of some of this technology? Thank you, George. I mean, so I guess that sort of leads us into our next topic, which is sort of where are we going from here? And there's a couple of uh, short-term um, answers. So the first would be to, um, to sort of follow the pledge or like the pledge on LinkedIn or Facebook. You, we um, have an announcement for the pledge on Twitter. And then we have a sign up right now that we're putting in the chat. 
for anyone who wants more information about the pledge as we go forward, there's a couple different ways to get involved. Um, the first is that if you work at a company that might be interested in the pledge, to get in touch with us and we can talk to you about how the you might take the pledge. The other is if you work in um, the sort of environmental and engineering space, we have an opportunity coming up in November for a workshop specifically thinking about how these pledged patents might be used. George, do you wanna say just a few words about that workshop? Uh, sure, I'm happy to. It's, it's still in the planning stages. Um, and again, we, we invite uh, input on um, what, what exactly the, the structure should be. Um, but, but the idea is, you know, we, we really want to overcome some of the hurdles that earlier efforts uh, struggled with, which is a great, you know, input of IP into uh, this, this community, but, but not as much outreach to those who might be users. And so, you know, we, in, in this area, we, we are trying to gather up with some environmental engineers and other experts from fields that might be able to make use of this technology um, and others who might be willing to pledge, right? This, uh, you know, as grateful as, as everyone is to the three companies who founded this, this is not intended to be an exclusive club. Um, the door is open for other companies to join and institutions, uh, governmental agencies, you know, we're starting to uh, to talk with, um, as I mentioned, Sandia and NASA, uh, NASA JPL are participants in the Open COVID Pledge. Um, and, you know, a lot of valuable patents are held in our national labs and government agencies, and those are particularly uh, salient in the green and clean tech space. And so, you know, we're, we're hoping to uh, interest other pledgers as well as users of the pledge technology and anyone who wants to be involved in a uh, sort of roll up your sleeves, uh, look at the technology uh, discussion, um, you know, sign up on the link that Meredith just posted and uh, we'll keep you updated as to sort of when uh, and how this will be occurring, uh, I guess probably in November. Great. Thank you. And so I think the other important thing is that, you know, when we talk about companies taking this pledge, it's important that there is sort of a public demand for that. So if you work in environmental advocacy, if you're working in areas that think about sort of the demand side for this, this is an important question to sort of add to the bundle of um, responsible steps that we increasingly want to expect from people who have uh, economic and social power, right? Like there is this sort of, I think it's important to evolve towards this sort of minimal set of environmental and social actions that we expect from leaders in technology in other sort of large industries to say, here are a sort of set of things that you can do to work towards a reduction of waste, work towards these climate change goals. And our hope is to sort of continue to raise the pledge as one of that bundle of things that you expect from companies who are acting as responsible actors in a social and environmental context. So for those of you who work on the advocacy side, I think including this pledge in that bundle of things that you look at and evaluate is important. Um, going forward, or George, you wanna- And in fact, I just add a, a small footnote to what uh, Meredith just said. Um, you know, one of the things with the Open COVID Pledge that was uh, really gratifying and surprising and, and gratifying to us was the uh, incredible amount of support that we got from advocacy groups like um, universities allied for essential medicines um, and, uh, and Creative Commons and other sort of nonprofits and NGOs. Um, you know, even though they don't have IP per se to contribute, um, they were uh, wonderful uh, advocates and proselytizers um, for the project. And on the environmental side, um, we'd love to uh, start to generate that kind of uh, support base as well. Thank you. And I think, you know, over the next um, two months, we're probably likely to see a lot of discussion of what can be done as climate change. We're coming up to the next um, Conference of the Parties for the Paris Convention that'll be happening at the um, very beginning of November in Glasgow. And so as we talk about what can be done, there's obviously this sphere of action that is and must be government action. But I think at the same time, there's this sphere of, of steps that individuals 
can take themselves, that they can push the companies they interact with and the people in the sort of public sphere to do. And so thinking about, you know, as we go into this um, period of talking a lot about climate change and what can be done, as this is one piece of that puzzle. So I would encourage people to uh, go to that link, sign up for information, and um, you know, like this on the Facebook and LinkedIn pages, and we will uh, follow up. We'll have some more events as we come out of this November workshop talking about some specific technologies that we might think might be at the sort of leading edge of things that are ready to be used or adopted by people who are interested in relying on the pledge. Any last thoughts? Um, the only other thing I would probably share uh, is please share this with your corporate and your sustainability teams. You will likely see that this is a huge high area of importance for them. And even if some folks aren't thinking about it within the company, I'm sure they are in the higher ups as well. This is something that we want to be thought leaders in. We want to be ahead of the game and help lead the pack versus having to wait, be too late and be reactionary. That's that's a great point, Sean. And you know, also for for those participants who are who really want to take an active role in the pledge, we are building an advisory board for sort of key players. So if if you really want to take a leadership role and, and work with us to sort of spread the word, let us know and we'll see if that's a good fit. Great. I think that's a great point to stop on. Thank you all very much for joining us. And um, if anyone uh, has a colleague who might be interested in this, the recording will be up next week. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.